goodness, 2020, can somebody say, woo? 2020. Remember all those years ago when 2020 started and we thought it was going to be the greatest of times? You know what I mean? Like we had a Christmas party this time last year looking forward to 2020. It's the roaring 20s, baby. And it was. My gosh, man. But it hasn't ended up quite being the type of year that we thought it would be, has it? It's not the year that we believed it would be or that we hoped it would be. Honestly, even for those of us who would consider ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, this hasn't seemed to be a year where we've experienced a lot of wins. In fact, some of us might say we've experienced more loss than we have wins. Some of us might say that we've had more downs than we have ups. Some of us might say that we've got more questions than answers. But here's what I've noticed throughout this strange time. That in all ways, in all days, in all things, there can be redemptive purpose. And so even in the midst of this strange season, this crazy time, I've learned a couple of things that I want to share with you. Is that okay if I share a couple of things that I've learned with you? The first thing that I've learned during this season is everybody is an expert. Or at least they know who the experts are. And they could share a link with you, but they won't because even if they did, you wouldn't look at it. (laughs) Because if you looked at it, you would discredit it anyway. The second thing that I've learned is this. I think that all of us are doing our very best to take on every, take in everybody's information in order to be informed, to be up to date, or to just simply be woke, y'all. But it's come at a cost. And I think what it's done because everybody does really love, I think everybody, I think we love people. I think we love people. I think we're invested in people. I think we want to do life with people. I think we want to understand people. I think that we want to be in unity with people. But what it's done is it's overwhelmed our souls. Because none of us were ever intended to take on or take in information the way that we've taken on or taken in information in this age. There's too much information at our fingertips in order for us to really be able to, with any clarity, navigate and move forward in our lives. And so what was intended for our good has ultimately contributed to many of our demise maybe not demise, but a place in our lives where we feel like we're deficient or we're lacking more than we've been efficient or moving forward. Maybe that's not you. Maybe this is just good information for somebody that you know. Maybe, just maybe, you could provide the link to this teaching for them. Maybe, just maybe, it could encourage souls. We've been left in this place where we've felt overwhelmed, maybe that we have a belly full, but all at the same time we've been left feeling completely empty, lacking, really, really, really wanting. And as I began to inventory some of these thoughts and some of these things and And uh, some of these ideas, it reminded me of a conversation that I had a couple of months ago with a guy. And it, I don't know him well, but I know him well enough to know that he's a church guy. He goes to a church, he attends a church, he, um, you know, from from all intents and purposes, I would assume that um, that he is, uh, that he is a Christ follower. But he just started in on me, and he was, you could tell, overwhelmed, you know? He was 
at the point where he had had a belly full, yet he was feeling completely empty. This conversation left me in a place where I was reeling for a couple of days because I felt like I didn't know that I had any answers for him. Because the picture that he painted was so bleak and it was so dark and it was so down. He said things like, Matt, we're doing all we can to make ends meet, working from home, trying to continue to prove our worth to our employer, convincing them not to eliminate our position because they can do without us being in the room. All the while trying to homeschool our kids, which is something brand new to us. How do I see to it that my kids don't turn out like me? I'm seeing in my children some depression setting in. This remote learning is not as easy on our kids, and we've learned it's not as easy on the teachers as we had thought it might be. says to me, I'm doing everything I can to avoid being in public so as not to offend half of the friends on my list, but at the same time trying to be faithful in the place where I feel like I'm supposed to be and not offend the other half of the people on my list. I'm trying to learn to be sensitive in, in my speech. But all the while, man, I'm just feeling overwhelmed by these few things that I've said to you and then the dozen or more other things that I have to be aware of at the same time. He says to me, he looks at me, he says, I know you pastor a church. I go to a church, but you pastor a church. And he says to me, Matt, where is God in all of this? Forget about humanity. I've lost all hope in humanity, he told me. But I do feel like I have a little bit of hope in God. But I just can't find him in the midst of this. I can't see him. Is he there? Is he real? And again, like I said, this, this conversation left me reeling. Because the church answer is, hey, he, he's with you. He's closer than you think, right? This was literally on the heels of me finishing up the series, Hope is Closer Than You Think which is one of my favorite series of all time that I've ever preached in our church. And so I want to tell him, hey, hope is closer than you think. And as I do, I realize that while he goes to church and while he goes through the motions, there's very little understanding of who the person of God is for him. And the reason that he's feeling so lonely and the reason that he's feeling so disconnected is because of this. His first look is to people. His first look is to family. His first look is to his employer. His first look is to the government. His first look is to finances. His first look. And I think that one thing that 2020 has caused us to do is to make our first look be on things that are not God, things that are not Christ. And so I want to challenge you to bring your attention back, to bring your first look back to the person of Jesus. And I want to challenge you that as you do, bring your first look back to the person of Jesus. That what you look at first will determine what happens next. It's no secret that this church is a church who believes in the principle of first. What you do first with your time will dictate and determine what happens next. What you do when you uh, uh, first with your treasure, with your talents, will determine and dictate what happens next. I feel like we should be people who are Christ followers that always give our first and our best of our time, of our talents, of our treasure to the Lord so that our first look, we can be certain, is on the person of Jesus. Somebody say first look. Would you pray with me this morning? 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray today that you would lead us and guide us, that you would show us Jesus like we've never seen him before. I pray that you would lead us and guide us by the power of your spirit, that we might be able to leave this place not just encouraged and not just with a little goosebump, but Father, with an understanding that we can move forward toward eternity in spite of all that's taken place or happened around us. Father, we also want to just pause, take a time out, and say thank you for allowing the Huskers to score more points than the Boilermakers yesterday. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, everybody. Turn to your neighbor and say, go Big Red. Holy cow. You know, here's the deal, everybody. I think the majority of us can relate to my friend, right? I think that as we've been looking at this season in our lives, I think that we can relate to my friend, and I think that we could say something like or similarly along the lines of, man, I'm losing hope in humanity or I've lost hope in humanity. I'm even having a hard time seeing where God's at work. And again, I would venture to say that I think what's taking place is we're giving so much time and attention to things that are not God, it's causing us to truly miss God in the midst of what's going on. And so I want to remind us of just a couple of things. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, Christianity 101. It's like I go to church basics, you know what I'm saying? But if I can remind us of it, I think we might just be in, in better shape. So will you guys give me some grace and pretend like I'm just preaching a jam-up message this morning? You know, you guys know we are a hollaback church at Mercy City, right? So I'm going to say something that's very elementary this morning. I need y'all to be like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? And just go for it because I'm telling you what, we're like, we're, we're like, uh, I love, Pastor Chris Hodges says this. He says, hey, everybody, I'm just going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, okay? So here we go. Christmas cookies on the bottom shelf. Everybody get one on the way out, and um, you guys will just be uh, blessed by that in the name of the Lord. But let's just pretend like it's the most amazing message you've ever heard, okay? Yeah. Ever! That's a good start for five of you, but everybody else in here, I feel like y'all can do better. That's, that's, that's great. Here's my question. Here's my question. Like I said, this is basic. This is basic. But if you would find yourself in that place where you're saying, you know what, Pastor Matt, I think I'm losing my hope in humanity. My question is this, why is your hope in humanity? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I know that's really easy. Like, it's kind of like one of those things like, duh, <laughs> You know, like, I don't want my hope to be in humanity. I want my hope to be in the Savior of humanity. You see what I'm saying? Because it's when my hope is in the Savior of humanity that I can actually bring some answers instead of more cause for concern to humanity. Do you see what I'm saying? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not here to say that that means that everything is going to be smooth sailing, okay? Please understand that. Not everything is going to be smooth sailing. It might be difficult. You might walk through some trials. You might see some difficulties in your life. But signing up and signing on with Jesus is never a promise to an A-OK -okay life. You know what I'm saying? I don't know who ever told you that or where you got that idea, but you just weren't reading the Bible, <laughs> you know? Somebody say first look. Here's the first look that we have of the birth of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a village in Galilee. Now, Elizabeth and Mary were related, okay? And um, Elizabeth was pregnant 
with a guy that we later come to know as John the Baptist, okay? John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. It's significant because uh, Elizabeth could not conceive or have a child, and so um, this is a big deal because John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one that, um, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, um, says that he was like, he ate um, like locusts and wild honey, and he was just, he wore like camel hair clothes, um, that doesn't sound super comfy to me, but, you know, some people just kind of do their own thing. It's, it's interesting, yeah. right? <laughs> um, anyway, so it was kind of like he was, he was the guy that came to set the stage for who the person of Jesus was. So next time you're convinced that somebody can't be used or you can't be used to set the stage to preach the gospel of Jesus, just remember John the Baptist came from parents who could not conceive. He was raised in a home that, um, you know... It, it was good, it was just, um, I mean, ultimately, there must have been a little bit of weirdness going on there that he would go out and live in the wilderness for a time. You know what I'm saying? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, cool. Like, um, I love all you people who, you know, you conspiracy theorists, like, we got to get off the grid, brother, shut off the internet. You know, that's, that's cool, but I, at the same time, I mean, you know, it's, it's a little bit, like, out there. But God can use those people, which is super cool. So if you're one, and it, even if you're not, I think God can use you. So that's good news, everybody. Good news, right? <sighs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so he shows up to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. That's key. A descendant of King David. That's key. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is, what? With you. I love this. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. That's, that's how we get when God's really with many of us, too. Like, I'm a little confused about this, right? Because I find my answers on Facebook more than anything else. I, I take my concerns to Facebook more than I take them to a God who's with me. Again, maybe this is just a link worth sharing to somebody else who's, maybe. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how could this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Some of you, God has shown up and said, I'm with you. I'm for you. And I would like to see you fulfill or do X, Y, or Z. And you said, God, how can this be? I'm not educated. I don't have what it takes. My parents weren't this. My parents weren't that. I'm not qualified. That's what Mary was saying. I'm not qualified. I haven't gone through the proper channels to be able to conceive yet. How are you going to do something significant on the inside of me? Listen, God does things on the inside of you by the power of his Holy Spirit because he is with us. Do not count out what God counts in. Do not discredit what God gives credit to. <laughs> Matthew chapter 1, I love this. Verse 23 says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she'll give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. And we talk about this all the time during this season of the year. Emmanuel, God with us. Well, what does that actually mean? 
Here's why it's so significant and so, so important that Jesus was born to a virgin in the line of King David. Here's why it was important. Because if you jump back to Isaiah chapter 9, check this out, everybody. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah was a prophet, and this book was written 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years before the angel showed up to Mary. 700 years before what I just read you. And listen to what it says, verse number 6. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. That simply means the authority. The authority of a new kingdom. The authority of a new way. The authority of something foundational that will move forward in the midst of chaos. In the midst of pain. In the midst of confusion. The authority will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And his government or authority and its peace will never end. It will last forever. Guess what? This was written 700 B.C. That included, forever included, the time when Jesus was born. That included 1000 A.D. That also includes 2000, now 2020 and 21. Guess what? Forever his authority will reign. Do you hear what I'm saying? It will never end. His rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make all of this happen. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make all of this happen. You know what his passionate commitment was? It was you. And it was me. And it was you. It was you and it was your children. It was your grandchildren. His passionate commitment was to you. And that's why he saw to it that these things would be fulfilled. See, this isn't some just cool story that happened to be in a book that some of us are like rallying our lives around. No, this was 700 and thousands of more, uh, hundreds of more other prophecies that were fulfilled by the birth and the person of Jesus Christ. See, the reason that Jesus is so important to us is not just because he was born and he lived a good life and he died on a cross. Yes, all of that was fulfillment to prophecy of people who didn't even know anything about Jesus. We have the luxury of seeing it from now back. These people were speaking it into the future, saying this is what I believe will take place or must take place in order for the Lord's passionate love to be poured out on his people. See, the reason that God was so passionate, the, 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 the Lord of hosts of heaven's armies, the reason he was so passionate is because he saw you and he saw me. And he saw the level of discontent and disconnection. He saw the level of overwhelming feelings. He saw the level of being tired and weary in our soul. And he knew that the only way for us to overcome these things is if he were with us. And there was only one way that the God of heaven could be with us. It was if he chose to step down from heaven, come to earth in the form of a man, flesh and blood, walk among us, live among us, breathe among us, Navigate life among us. Pay a price for us. So that the power of his Holy Spirit could now, after his death, burial, and resurrection, dwell within us. This is how God is with us. But still in the midst of it, we're so tempted 
to give our first look to other things or to something else. And I want to challenge you as your pastor. Come on. If you're with us online, come on, lean in. In the room, lean in. If you're upstairs in the overflow, lean in with us today. God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. There are a couple of things that I want to challenge us over the next few weeks to look first at. And this is how we inventory our lives. Okay, what am I taking a look at first? And I think that we see it right here in the scriptures. The first thing that I think we need to understand is the thing, the only thing that we need to look at first is the person of Jesus. We need to understand that Luke chapter 1 was a fulfillment of prophecy. And Jesus being born of a virgin in the line of David was another fulfillment of prophecy. Where in the Old Testament, the prophets would tell of this Savior, of the Messiah that was to come. And Jesus Christ himself was the fulfillment of every single one of these prophecies. I don't have time to teach them all. But he himself was the fulfillment of it all. Nobody that's alive today is the fulfillment of any of it. And if we're looking to them for our answers, if we're looking to our boss for the answers, if we're looking to our husband or wife for the answers, if we're looking to our kids for the answers, if we're looking to our mayor for the answers, our governor for the answers, our president or president-elect for the answers, we're going to miss it. If our first look is on them, then we will absolutely miss him. The Bible says that God is a jealous God. And if we divide our attention, if we divide our focus, if we divide our firsts, we're going to be divided. And the scripture also tells us that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Come on, everybody. There's so much hope in the person of Jesus. There's so much truth. There's so much life. There's so much fulfillment. There's so much purpose in the person of Jesus. Let's lean into Jesus. So how do we know if we're looking at Jesus first? Here are a few things that I think that we can look at and draw from the scriptures. Number one, wonderful counselor. Somebody say wonderful counselor. Here's what wonderful means. Full of wonder. Full of marvel. Full of awe. How many times if you got done scrolling through your social media feed and you've sat back and you've thought, oh, God, you're so good. <laughs> When's the last time you got in a, de a debate with your friends or family or loved ones and just, oh, God, you're so wonderful. When's the last time that you jumped off of Fox News or CNN and just said, oh, God, I marvel at your glory and your goodness? You haven't. You know why? Because there's nothing wonderful about that counsel. Where's the wonderful counsel? If it's not wonderful, it's not Jesus. If it's not awe-inspiring, if it's not you sitting back and marveling at the goodness of it, it's not God, it's not Jesus, it's not the wonderful counsel that you should be giving your first look to. You should not wake up and look at social media to see what's taking place. Who gives a flip? It doesn't matter. It might matter this year, but it doesn't matter in eternity. Come on, everybody. We're so focused on the temporary that we're missing what's taking place in eternity. 
And we're dividing relationships and friendships over something that's taken place in the course of the last three weeks. God's called us to be in relationship with him first, but with each other next for eternity. Counselor is this, to advise, consult, counsel, or to give plan. Where are you getting your counsel from? Can I ask it this way? Who's discipling you? I had a mentor tell me several years ago, he's an old army general, and he said to me, Matt, who or where you give the majority of your time and focus is who's discipling you. I wonder if your screen time could give you any indication of who's discipling you. I know I looked at this a couple of months ago and I was convicted. I was convicted. And I could tell in my mind and some of the conversations that I were having was starting to tank just a little bit. Who's who's counseling you? Who's discipling you? Who's giving you advice or wisdom? I love it, I've, and I've had to do this. I've, I've forced this to happen, okay? Every morning now, I roll over, I pick up my phone, and it gives you options of where you've gone first most consistently. Y'all know what I'm talking about? My first option is the YouVersion Bible app. You know why? Because a few months ago when I noticed this, I realized something's gotta change. I'm giving myself first and I'm giving my best to something that I don't want discipling me. And so I've I've told everybody I could to hold myself accountable. The first thing I do every morning is I look at the verse of the day. The first thing that I do every morning. I don't listen to music until I do my daily Bible reading. That's not the case for my entire life. That's only been a recent, maybe last year or so thing. I hate to admit that, but it's true. I was getting my counsel elsewhere. And there was nothing wonderful about it. There was nothing awe-inspiring about it. I wasn't marveling over the things that God was doing in my life. So I wonder if we could honestly take a step back and say, am I in awe? Am I marveling over the counsel that I'm receiving? Over the discipleship course that I'm taking? Because if we're not, I'm telling you, it's not Jesus. Why do we know that? Because he will be called Wonderful Counselor. And if Jesus is leading the charge on that, your counsel will feel wonderful. It's a slow shift, but it takes one decision at a time, one step at a time, one day at a time, one moment at a time. Don't be hard on yourself, don't beat up on yourself because that also is not from God. When you're hard on yourself and you got a guilty conscience, that's not from Jesus. Jesus brings hope. The second thing that I wanna focus in on today is this mighty God. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. My first look will be to the wonderful counselor. My first look will be to the mighty God. Why do we look to the mighty God? Mighty means this, strong, brave, or bold. And I think some people and some things we could look at and they would seem mighty, they would seem strong, and they would seem bold. But we can't forget about the next piece, God, mighty God. And while some things might seem God or Christ-like, if they're not Christ, they're not like Christ. Do you hear what I'm saying? If that thing that is Christ-like is not attributing, attributing its likeness to Christ, then it is not 
Christ. I don't care how good it is, how much peace it offers or whatever. If it's not Christ or attributing its likeness to Christ, it is not Christ. They're so good, they've got such good ideas. Are they attributing them to Christ? Because if they're not, it's not Christ. Mighty God. This is why it's so important that the mighty God gets our first look. Because it's only in God that we can truly be saved. It's only in God, it's only through the person of Jesus that we can truly embrace the salvation that was intended for us. It's only in the person of Jesus Christ. It's not in the next new good idea. It's not this thing, this person, this man was prophesied about thousands of years ago. He's already come. And he's already in the midst of it all. And I don't know about you, but that gives me so much hope and excitement for the future because I don't have to look for anything else. There's answers in nothing else but the person of Jesus. All I have to do is surrender my heart, surrender my ideas, surrender my likeness to the person of Christ. And I won't always get it right, and nor will you. But can I encourage you? If you've come to the point in your life where you're willing to fight over something, over anything that is not Christ, I wonder if you'd be willing to step back to open your hands, open your heart. Surrender your life. Because it's only the person of Christ, it's only the person of Jesus that's worth standing for. It's only the person of Jesus that is, that is worth declaring his goodness, operating in his likeness. Some of you are thinking, that's really hard. But I hope that what I showed you today is it's not that hard because God is with us. He's with us. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that you're saved, that means God is with you the person of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you in here today, some of us in here today, like me a couple of months ago, you could say, my first look hasn't been to Jesus. And I need to repent and turn back toward Jesus. Some of you in here, some of you online today, you might say, my first look has never been to Jesus. I believe that he is the reason that God is with us. If that's you, whether it's the first time, first time in a long time, or just a brand new recommitment. I made a brand new recommitment to Jesus just this morning. I 
just felt it in my spirit. It needed to take place. If that's you, would you just stand with me? If that's you, would you stand with me? Wow, it's, it's, a, it's a bold move, Pastor Matt. Well, we serve a mighty, bold, brave, strong God. Come on, all over this room, if that's you. Come on, it's time. Jesus for real. Jesus first. Jesus most. Jesus only. Jesus always. That's me. I'm going to receive God with us today. Come on, whether you're here in person, in overflow, or online, I wonder if you just lift your hands with me. Father, obviously I pray for these people. Your sons and your daughters making a new, a fresh, a bold, a mighty commitment saying first and most from this day forward I'm going to serve, I'm going to follow you no more going through the motions but do something significant and powerful on the inside of us Father I thank you that your revelation would flow as your spirit speaks God let us be people who have ears to hear Thank you.